was enough. Um, the reason why I show you that is because uh, I, at the beginning when I was sort of introducing the idea that um, the, demo a, the Turkish democracy is very different than what we are used to here in, in, in Germany or in Britain. Um, this is a band called Group Yoram who are well, well, well renowned, or renowned for being sort of anti-authoritarian and anti-government. And um, if you noticed, all the instruments were broken. Um, that was because um, they are always having trouble with authorities in some way or another. And um, the police went into their sort of rehearsal space, which is a cultural center, maybe a bit like this. Um, and they, this is not something unusual, they uh, arrested all the members uh, because they found a hammer, they found about 50 pounds, and they found costumes. Um, the hammer apparently was a weapon of terrorism. The 50 pounds was money used for terrorism. And the costumes for a performance were military costumes. Um, and they broke all their instruments. Um, the band then were released. Um, and they shot this as sort of a reaction to, to what had happened to them. And then they were arrested again. So that's the sort of environment um, musicians live in. Now on to the, the real thing, finally. Oh, it worked, okay, good. Um, I never use Apple, so I'm not sure how to do all this. Is that working? Yes, it is. Okay, finally, okay, so. I, I, like I said, like I said, um, like we're trying to talk about here, I'm trying to look at what are the limits of and the potential of protest in music, music in protest. Um, as Daria had said before, there is sort of lots of debate, as we know, academic debate as to what is, the, how much potential is there in music as a political sort of force. Um, and some are very optimistic, some sort of streams of thought, if you want, and some are very pessimistic. Um, and so within that, within that sphere, there's also people look at, well, what kind of politics are there in music? And again, there's a whole range of politics in music. As I'm sure you can think of just yourself at the, at the, top, at the top of your head, whether you're thinking about Beyonce or Justin Bieber or um, Group Yoram, who we just saw. Um, but, w so, but one sort of politics that this, this presentation is going to look at is more sort of progressive um, socialist ideas, if you want, more, more sort of progressive ideas. Um, and it's just one in a whole spectrum of ideas within popular music. Um, again, when research, a lot of research which does look at popular music tends to look at lyrics as, as sort of like, well, that's where the politics is. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm a huge music fan. And if you asked me to sing one of my favorite songs, I'd probably get about 20% of the lyrics right. Right, and I think we can all agree that most of us are like that. So, I, uh, you know, me and a bunch of other people think, well, you know, it's not just about the lyrics. If you're going to think about, look at a song and think, what is it about? What are the politics going on here? You really have to think about um, it as a multimodal thing. That's the word I'm using, multimodal, meaning um, it's about, it's not just about the lyrics. It's about the sounds, the music sounds we hear. It's about um, the, the imagery that goes along with music. It's about the context, you know, whether that's social, political, production, consumption. It's all these things together. That's where the, that's how the politics and music sort of work. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be looking at. Okay, so I'm going to think, I'm going to be thinking about music in that sort of way, as a multimodal thing. Um, so before I can really start um, this, I have to sort of. I have to like, sort of put some sort of constraints on what, what, or define some of the things that I'm talking about here. First of all, whenever we're talking about politics and music, this word authenticity keeps coming up. Um, because as I was saying to my class just yesterday, um, that you know, if, if Justin Bieber started singing um, anti-Trump songs, I think a lot of his fans would, be, would scratch their heads. You know, but he can sing about, you know, like, I'm sorry, and, you know, in his whispery sort of voice, and he'd get away with it, right? Um, so, so when we're thinking about authenticity, what we're thinking about, or the definition I'm going to use is I'm going to say, well, it's this sort of, this sort of 
sincerity or playing from the heart that we as listeners give to the performers. So that way, like I said, um, Group Yoram can get away with you know, talking from their sort of perspective and Justin Bieber can get away with what he does. All right, um, and another part I want to, another sort of contentious issue I want to sort of clarify my position on is when we're talking about the politics in um, political songs, if you want, um, I've noticed seem to re lean heavily on n not just popular sort of politics, but populism. Okay, and what I mean by this, okay, popular, populism both means well-liked, but then when we get to the idea of populism, what, I'm th what we're thinking about here is there always seems to be the sort of constructed us and thems, us being the, the people, right, and them being the elite. Now, in, in all different songs, depending on the context, you have different definitions of who is the elite and who are the public um, or the people. And the last idea, which I think we've touched on, like I said, Daria touched on and I've touched on again, but uh, again, it's this idea that I'm accepting that there's loads of sort of confusion or at least divergent opinions about how political music can be. I mean, come on, let's face it, when we're listening to music, number one we're listening to is for entertainment, right? It's to enjoy ourselves. So we have to sort of, so there's this sort of contentious issue, if you want. Um, the story I love telling my students, I'm going to tell you, I've got, I probably have a minute to tell you, is this puts it all in perspective for me. Um, a long time ago, um, my, a girlfriend and I went to watch Billy Bragg. We found a Billy Bragg, of course, right? So Billy went and watched Billy Bragg, and, um, you know, we watched the concert with, as per normal, you know, we're sort of bopping around a bit as you do, and at the end of it we walked out, and I, I said to her, what did you think? And she was not a Billy Bragg fan, she didn't really know him. She said, well, he's good to dance to. And I said, yeah, he's good to dance to. Anything else? She said, no, not really. And me being somebody who's very interested in politics and music, said, well, didn't she kind of get, what, no, 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 he's good to dance to. Um, so that's this idea that, you know, how much this, this sort of very contentious relationship between politics and pop. Um, that's an illustration, I think. Okay, so, um, so when we're talking about um, music and politics, there's a whole load of sort of, um, like within these issues, I'm talking about pop, politics, authenticity. Um, there's a whole load of contexts we can deal with, right? Um, whether it's, I mean, I've got this long list here. Um, but here I'm going to look at a protest song, and it's within, um, so I'm constraining our half-hour conversation to just a protest song. Um, and we're going to start with Gezi Park. And this is going to be my, my case study, if you want. Um, so to give you a little context of Gezi Park, I mean, I'm, I don't want to bore you to death with it, but I'm sure just to remind you, because it has been five, coming up to five years now, wow. All right, so in June 2013, over three and a half million Turks protested in over 80 cities. All right, this is a lot of sort of facts that didn't seem to make it over here to the West. Um, it started out as um, a couple, a few city planners and environmentalists who were um, protesting against um, one of the last green spaces left in central Istanbul called Gezi Park, which the government AKP is the name of the government, um, and we've all heard of Erdogan. They wanted to sort of get rid of the green park and put in another shopping mall, because we need another shopping mall. Right? We don't need any more green spaces left. Um, and put in a, a controversially put in a mosque. Um, so, so the protest really was, all I can see is this thing, by the way. Um, the protest really was, started out as this, sort of this, this anti, well, sort of an environmental thing, and, and also a protest against the government's neoliberal economics policy of privatizing any public thing um, that they can and, and turning it over to interests, which, funnily enough, seem to always have links with the government. Um, but the, the protest quickly grew out of this, like I said, you know, a, a dozen people or so protesting over these things into a more sort of um, anti-government um, resistance, if you want, against the AKP and Erdogan himself. Um, 
The police response was quite brutal, which I think that did make it into the media over here. Uh, with, what is it, the, the numbers are here, so what is it, 3,000 arrests, 8,000 injuries, and at least six deaths. I mean, that's sort of controversial as well. Um, I, I think the whole Gezi Park thing was really a manifestation of what's going on in Turkey, this sort of very um, uh, divisive sort of politics. On the one hand, you have secularists, I mean, I'm simplifying it a lot, but on one side you have sort of secularists, on the other side you have AKP, um, uh, you know, who are economically neoliberal, um, socially conservative, have roots in Islam. Um, and AKP, like I said, a, a, a public space being privatized, funnily enough, to friends of Erdogan, who was going to make millions out of this mall and, and mosque. Um, it's just one sort of, sort of, piece in a large jigsaw puzzle of what, what's going on there. Um, as a part of the protests, when, like I said, I was there and, and, and um, I noticed me and another sort of, actually a musicology friend of mine, noticed that there was all these sort of um, music videos coming up on YouTube. And so we collected 140 of them. Um, so that's, that's a whole lot. And that was just in that first month. Um, and then also, as an aside, there's also been quite a few sort of official um, videos that have also used sort of imagery and stuff or reference in some way or another to Gezi Park. Um, I think I talked a bit about this before we got going, but I'll just sort of give you some sort of numbers and facts. I think music's important, especially in a place like Turkey, when you have a mediascape like this, all right? And, you know, if we quickly go, I mean, I'm not going to go in every detail, but you might, you probably know, you've heard of this stuff because this stuff kind of makes the news and times, right? There's always been a close relationship between government and politics, I'm sorry, government and media in Turkey. So that's nothing new. But what's happened is since AKP has come into power, that sort of relationship has become far more solidified. Um, opposition voices have been more or less shut down. Um, you know, and, and, then, and especially since Gezi Park, but even bef before and during Gezi Park, this process has been going on. I think the first, uh, AKP's first um, requisition, I think might be the word, first sort of turning the tide of media for in their favor was within the first year of them being in uh, power. So um, it's something that's been going on. Turkish media is, r r um, is rated as not free anymore. Um, and popular music has also sort of felt the effects of um, AKP. Uh, and, and, and I think this happens in, in sort of all levels of music. For example, so if you want to protest musically, I, I sort of wrote down three um, sort of categories of obstacles. One is live music. Um, members are arrested, concerts banned, or last minute cancellations. I mean, I've witnessed this, that band, I just showed you the picture of uh, the little one minute of Group Yoram. I went to see them uh, a couple of years ago, and basically I got to the scene of where the concert was supposed to be, and there I was greeted by water cannons and police and tear gas, and the band had been arrested before they even plugged in an instrument for spreading propaganda, which I found quite... Interesting. Um, needless to say, I was the foreigner, so I went up to him and said, in, I said, what is the concert on still? And the policemen were not very, um, not very happy about me. They said, sort of like, get lost, kind of thing. Um, so live performance. Um, in recordings, again, this is another way uh, bands which might not, the government might not favor um, they can control. Because in every, everything in, in Turkey, you have to get a band roll, it's called a band roll, which is sort of a thing that shows that you've paid your tax before you can sell anything. And so um, the Turkish Ministry of Culture is in charge of this. And basically, if, if you have stuff such as, you know, song, music, which is, might be um, critical of the government or very pro-Kurdish, uh, they, they, or, or lots of swearing or something the government doesn't like, they will not give you a ban rule. And the third way is um, broadcasting, which I've told you before how the government is very quite restrictive. So obviously, 
anti-government music is very unlikely to make it onto any sort of broadcasting, whether it's television or radio. So the resulting mediascape then is one of tight political control and big business influence and control in most areas of production and distribution. Um, and even the internet these days um, is, tight, is not as tightly controlled as, as broadcasting, but it's still, there's still repercussions um, to the use of that. Uh, for example, just this week, people who are in uh, Turkey, people who are using social media to talk against the Syrian invasion they're doing right now, are being arrested. Okay, so you're not, in the internet is not free of government control in Turkey. Okay, so my methodology, as I've kind of pointed out, but I'll go a bit more specific here. So, I had, I, me and my friend collected 140 videos. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at one, in, in specifically one, which I think sort of captures the spirit of what was going on there. Um, and it's, the band's called Marsis, and the song is called Oi Oi Regibum. Recep Tayyip Erdogan is the name of is Erdogan's full name. So it's like, my Recep is kind of what they're singing. Um, or the title of the song, sorry. Marsis is a band uh, a from the Karadeniz, which means Black Sea. Um, and their music kind of reflects that. It's, 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 it's kind of got a nice rock, you know, it's got a rock sort of um, feel and a rock sort of lineup, if you want. But they also have lots of sort of Black Sea uh, musical inf instruments. In this song, you're going to hear the, um, the Black Sea fiddle, if you want a fiddle that's associated with Black Sea music. Um, the clip that I'm going to play for you was not an official clip. Um, there was no official clip. Um, however, Marsis obviously thought something of it because they put it onto their Facebook page. Um, the title, chorus, melody are all a remake of that man's song up there, Oi Eminem. Um, ironically, Emine is the name of Type Recep Erdogan's wife, right? So they, they sort of played around with that a bit. Um, so again, like I told you before, I, I think look at music multimodally if you want. So um, I'm going to consider the lyrics, images, and musical sounds. Um, and how I'm going to do that is lyrically and visually, I'm going to consider how the people and their actions are represented. And the music, I'm going to consider what sort of, sort of ideas they may be communicating within this context. I now get a couple second break while I play you the video. I think I have time to play it. I hope I have time to play the whole thing. I don't know. I don't know how this works now. Here we go. Oh, God. And there's a play button somewhere. Ah, there it is. Gel 
gelsin onun sesini Dünya döner tersine Gel gelsin onun sesini Halkı koyun mi sandın Oy oy Recep ol Bir gün gelir üstüne Bir gün gelir üstüne Halkı koyun mi sandın Oy oy Recep ol Bir gün gelir Kaç kişi saysana, kaç kişi saysana Ha buraya baksana, oy oy Recep'um Kaç kişi saysana, kaç kişi saysana I didn't write all the lyrics down, but uh, as I said, I'm going to look at this multimodally, which means we're going to look at it lyrically in terms of sound, in terms of visuals. Here's just the first two verses, and here's that last bit at that end, that bit of scar bit that you might have heard at the end. It's rep repetitive over and over and over again, repeated over and over again, sorry. Um, so I'll give you 10 seconds, look at that, and we'll just go on. Okay, so. The lyrics, what we can hear in this, like, so my argument here is that it's really relying on populism, all right? Um, so we've got one of the sort of pillars of populism then is we have an elite who are like nasty. In this case, it's Erdogan, he's not listening. And in the, what, stuff in red is some of the lyrics, right? So were your eyes blind? So this is the action of Erdogan not listening and ignoring protesters, right? Come hear the voice of Gezi, they tell us. Again, so we are protesting becomes the voice, right? Whilst the action come here is prioritized, instructing Erdogan to listen to protests, which assumes he's not listening. Um, the next one, why didn't you see us? All right, so this could mean a whole load, a raft of things. Um, but basically, it's not giving us a whole load of detail. What it is telling us, though, again, is that Erdogan's not listening. And you kept hitting even when we said stop. Okay, so not only is he not listening, he's a nasty man, right? Um, so it's you know, negative power because he's hitting, he's re represented as despotic. Um, however, in all these sort of things, we don't have a lot of circumstances. It's quite unclear. Um, and, and, you know, love him or hate him, Erdogan didn't really kick anybody, all right? Let's, let's be honest. I mean, you know, he's... Uh, it was the police who were kicking, beating, shooting, tear gas, and pepper spraying protesters. Mind you, I mean, it was on Erdogan's approval, but he didn't actually do it. But what we're, so what we have in these lyrics then is we're having a real sort of discourse, if you want, of Erdogan being a really nasty guy, fitting into this sort of idea of populism. On the other hand, we have the, the, the people or the public who, in, in, the, in the case of the lyrics, are represented as the protesters. And Within this, sort of, within this sort of public, we have the idea that there's power, there's lots of people involved, uh, there's sympathy, and the protesters are united, which, you know, if you know much, well, things that we know about Gezi Park is that 
that was one of the reasons, one of its failures, is there was you know, no unity within the protest. Um, but anyway, this is how it's represented. So, for example, you kept calling us Chapelje. Chapelje is was a um, a negative sort of thing. It means like street person, if you want vagabond. Um, but, however, protesters actually took it on. It became sort of a badge of authenticity, if you want. Like, for example, the band I was in was called the Chapel Gym Music Orchestra. So, but anyway, um, so here we have protesters of being us, so the people, right? Uh, and we're being passivated, if you want, by being, being named, being called names by Erdogan. Um, so this sort of connotes a bit of sympathy towards us. Uh, one day you'll be held to account, one day it will come down on you. So here we have the idea, that we're, we're, we have us, the protesters, warning, um, warning Erdogan. So um, again, we have no real details going on here, um, but it's sort of empowering us, if you want. Um, come here, the voice of Gezi, check us out, count how many of us. So again, we have this idea, first of all, these are imperatives, right? Telling Erdogan what to do, uh, which of course connotes we have power. And also some of these things, such as count how many of us there are, this um, sort of, again, connotes the idea that you know, we are the public. There's loads of us. Um, and at the end, that, 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 that sort of scar bit at the end, we have jump, jump, who doesn't jump is. Here, we, again, we have Mars is telling us things to do, which, again, is sort of authentic, authentic, authenticating, there it goes, authenticating uh, Mars is, you know, as commanding us protesters to do something, which is to jump. Um, this chant, actually, as it goes, was, was a common chant you'd hear a lot in the protests to get people sort of wound up, if you want. And so it, again, authenticates them because they're like saying, look, you know, we were there. We know this is what we used to say. All right? Um, and, fun and funnily enough, I don't, um, when they're saying that jump, jump, who doesn't, who doesn't jump is, then in the visuals they were showing politicians and police, so they were sort of doing an us and them again. Um, so let's move on to the visuals. So the visuals are slightly different than the, um, than the lyrics. In the visuals now, the, the elite, the bodies, are the police and politicians. As we can see in the, in the visuals, the police are the ones who are doing the nasty things. So they're active. They're hitting and beating, um, what do I say, spraying, holding, beating, hitting, kicking. Um, these are pretty powerful sort of messages uh, that they're communicating. Um, and politicians are also um, visually separated as the elite who are like despotic because they're not listening again, right? So for example, they're verbally activating or posing. Erdogan talks but does not listen. This is that idea again coming out um, in, this sort of, in this picture right here. Um, we can see that through his dress and microphones that he's at, a power, uh, he's at a conference, so he's being powerful. But if you look at him, he's sort of, his facial expressions, he's not, exa he's not exactly being calm and relaxed, is he? He's, he's being quite aggressive. He's leaning forward, right? And then even the red and black behind, again, sort of, sort of connotes this sort of aggression. Um, again, feeding into this idea that the elite are despotic. Um, and again, on the other hand, we have... Oops. We have the um, protesters who are united and protesting as a party. This is a good thing, right? So very positive sort of things going on. Um, so protesters in this first picture here, here they are, they're in a line facing the camera. I mean, we can't really see their faces, but at least we're getting some sort of point of identification with them. Um, it's a group shot, right, which shows sort of unity. They're all working together, moving, actually what they're doing is moving the rubbish out of the park together. Right, again, connoting unity, which, as I've alluded to before, is far from the reality uh, on the ground. Um, and then also we have the idea, you know, that protesting is kind of fun. It's kind of cool, right? So um, we have couples hold hand, play guitars, flick peace signs, clap together, spray graffiti. These are all symbols associated with, you know, 1960s hippie anti-war culture. So authenticating um, protesters. Um, the, the, uh, funnily enough, if you remember, the, the initial um, protest was about the environment and about n sort of going against this privatization of everything. But we don't see any of that sort of in, in, in any of the visuals. Um, and if you look on this picture here, 
Um, it's, uh, again, I picked this one, you know, look at his body position, suggesting he's relaxed and cool, you know, against a background of chaos. He's wearing the Guy Fox mask, right, which is, is, was pop popularized um, from the film V for Vendetta, where, again, we had, you know, a character who was sort of defying an, a, an authoritarian government. If we go on to the music now, like I said, uh, what I've done here is, for us non-musos, I've just sort of graphically outlined the, 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 um, the, the melody, if you want. Um, and this is the first guitar bit at the beginning. Do -do 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 -do. Remember that bit? Do -do -do -do. You, sort of, you hear it throughout. All right, and, and I say this is um, sort of connoting danger, if you want. Uh, it goes, it, 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 okay, let me see what I write here just to make sure I don't repeat myself. Um, so we got a low register, which may suggest sort of power. Um, this, this fluctuates between the E and the F, right, which is the first and the second. Um, and the second is dominant, which may have the meaning potential, especially in this sort of case, uh, something in between, the promise of something else. Um, it connotes sort of uncertainty in the protest and change. Um, plays in the song's keynote, and then it's second, like the two, it's, it's a lot like the Jaws thing, isn't it? Do, 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 do. Okay, except, of course, we have the one extra one there. Um, so again, uh, you know, with the Jaws, they also fl um, go between the first and the second. Um, so again, we, and, and Jaws has the sort of connotations, if you want, of danger, evil, menace. Um, and, w and also, the, we've got this, it's a very narrow pitch range, if you want, um, which again suggests sort of constrained, strong feelings, such as constraints of fear and misery, right? And uncertainty, ca caution. Uh, the tempo, just like Jaws, is very fast, right? Which, again, just like the Jaws thing, articulates some kinds of danger. And the instrumentation used is, is a distorted guitar, right? It's dominated, it dominates this, this, this section of the song with, you know, and, and, and of course distorted guitars, yeah, um, just like heavy metal, with, with also with its connotations of a different kind of sort of danger and menace. Um, I say those combined, those sort of ideas, musical sort of sounds combined, sort of gives us this idea that this is dangerous times, and then the visuals sort of t make clear who, we are, who is behind this danger, which of course is Erdogan and the police. Um, another sort of theme, or if you want, within the musical sounds that I, I sort of picked up is this idea of chaos. You know, that, that, that bridge that we hear with the fiddle. It's about, I think it's nine times in the song. Um, so it's quite sort of pronounced part of the song. Um, here we've got this very wide range, um, which again connotes instead of the sort of constrained feelings, sort of more wide open f feelings. In this, in this case, I think within the context, excitement. Uh, here it's the third, which is dominant. And the sequence ends on the sixth. Both of these sort of have sort of more positive sort of connotations. Um, though again, uh, you know, the seventh might, you know, might sort of, again, if you listen to it kind of like, sort of at the end, you kind of think, well, it's still sort of uncertainty if you want. Um, tempo, again, this is like breakneck speed tempo. Um, fast changes in notes and disjunctive sound production can stand for a live energetic approach, according to Van Leeuwen, right? Here the mel melodic phrase is breakneck speed, again, sort of like promoting the sort of excitement and lawlessness going on. Uh, the pitch moving, ascending melodies, and if you think about ascending melodies or descending melodies, ascending melodies generally, for the most part, are quite positive sort of feelings, um, and they can just kind of energize us. Um, and the instrumentation going on at the same time. Here we've got the foregrounding of the fiddle with its high pitch, right? Again, offers sort of urgency, fun, chaos, right? So together, I think that that's what this sort of, these sort of sounds are telling us. Um, and then in the last 50 seconds, that scar bit, like, where, why does that fit in, I was thinking, musically? And I thought, well, it's kind of really accentuating the fact that, you know, hey, here we are all together, you know, when we're, you know, we're, this is a positive thing, you know, we, we are united. Um, and I think this is done in a number of ways. First of all, the, um, we've got the vocal instructing listeners to jump, just like in the protests, right? So this authenticates Marsis um, as being in the know. Uh, the tempo, if you notice that, that scarfing, it kept increasing, 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 a bit like the chicken dance, 
Right, do you remember that at, at parties, weddings, when you get really embarrassed because your aunties are doing that and your uncles are doing it? Yeah, right, the same thing, right? And so this is the same thing. It's getting more and more exciting. And we've got whoop -ah and yip going on, adding again to this sort of, you know, this exciting sort of time. Um, the sequence starts on the C minor, which may, you know, suggest some sort of sadness, but then changes up to a G major with, again, more positive connotations. Um, and I think within that scar bit at the end, we get, we get the idea, like the musical sounds kind of um, suggest unity in, in that. And what I mean by that is throughout the whole song, up to that point, we had the lead singer's voice way up front and no other voices. Then when it comes to the ska bit, we have, we have a sort of, he, he comes way down, we have a whole group all singing together, right? So here we got, so, you know, suggestion of, you know, we're all together in this vocally. Um, and it's easy to sing along to as well, because there's only three or four words, right? Jump, jump, who doesn't jump is. So, what can be my conclusion then, um, with all this together? Well, if we think about this, um, the video does draw upon populist discourses, right? Where we have the people, they're constructed and pitted against the elite, right? The people are protesters and musicians who are authentic, unified, and having fun, right? The elite are the police who are represented as violent and the politicians who are despotic and don't listen to us, right? So, so we then take this thing and think, okay, well, what is this telling us about pop and politics, especially of resistance? Well, one thing that I think is, is dominant in all three modes and across, across the whole sample, really, is this group and protester authenticity is really dominant, I think, in these, in these um, videos. Um, another thing we hear, I see a lot of, is um, the actual politics, you know, of, of environmental politics and uh, anti-neoliberal economic politics are gone. Instead, you get these other politics which are quite sort of abstract and obscure. There's no real sort of concrete stuff going on. Uh, there's, um, and number three, so what, what do I say then? I'm trying to balance these off then. So, okay, so this is, this is what we find. So within Turkey, what can we say about this? Well, on the one hand, we see popular political articulations of resistance, right? Which are rooted in populism. Um, so I think in the context, the political and social context of Turkey, I think this is kind of important. Even though, you know, however limited it is, I think this is important, where we're not getting pretty much any resistance to pretty much any government um, actions. Um, and so music videos such as these are one of the very few spaces that issues can be sort of articulated and talked about however obscure and however, however abstract they are. Um, and, and, you know, in this, there, there was, you know, there's been studies about how these sort of um, social media um, events, if you want, no, events is the wrong word, um, have actually made movements more popular across, you know, like not, not just in Turkey. Um, but then on the other hand, videos really, let's face it, don't really, are not really adding much politically um, around the issues around Gezi Park, if you think about, if you, like, you know, if you think about what we've just thought about and what we've just looked at here, right? Popular politics are articulated vaguely and symbolic actions, right, are taken from popular cu culture, are recycled. Protest is celebrated, so is being anti-establishment, right, and that inauthenticity. Um, and uh, like I said, th this is something. Right? And this is something in the context of Turkey, this is something, and, and it's something which, you know, hopefully in other sort of places, the politics can be articulated in other ways, but within Turkey, this is all you got, baby, generally. And that comes from that book, and that's me. Finished for now. Thank you, Lyndon, uh, for not only providing us with a theoretical framework for this day, but uh, also with this really interesting insight in your 
uh, work on protest music in uh, Turkey. And I think this uh, multimodal perspective is really promising because um, the song alone, for me, not, you know, I don't understand Turkish and uh, without the videos, um, it could have been anything. It could have been just any party song. So you have to uh, have the full picture, the, the sound, the video and the lyrics. So, are there any questions from the audience for Lyndon? There's one over there. The microphone is coming. Yeah, thank you for this uh, really interesting presentation. I'm uh, deeply interested in similar questions, so it was quite interesting for me to uh, see it from the perspective of a multimodal discourse. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, the exact date of the uh, songwriting or the recording distributing uh, time of the of the song because I think um, or my question would be if you think that there are differences in uh, music that is written as a direct response to political actions or events or if songs are b written before maybe short before or longer before and then later appropriated for political purposes and then put together in a YouTube video or something like that. Oh, okay yeah I um this particular video, uh, the song and the video, I know it was done in that month of the protests. Um, I know through their Facebook, I think they mentioned it. Um, but to answer the, the more broader question is, yes, um, there's a whole sort of idea that protest and music in protest is recycled over and over and over again. Um, for example, there's this other um, video I was thinking of using, but then I didn't use it. Um, and it was by this band called the Ringo Jets, who are from Istanbul. And they actually sing in English, which might have been better for this, actually. But um, I didn't use it. Um, but anyway, um, I've, I know them quite well, and I've, you know, we've, we've had official and then lots of unofficial over beer conversations. And, um, there, there's this, like I said, it's a very popular song actually, and it's an official video. Um, it's called, um, I, I forgot the name, it doesn't matter, none of us will remember anyway. But it's the Ringo Jets, um, and it was a, a video, they, sh they, they, they produced this song about six months before, oh, the Spring of War, it's called Spring of War. And it's a sort of, again, these sort of vague lyrics, you know, about, you know, the spring of war is coming, uh, you know, we are ready, you know, it's, again, it's the elite, you know, elites versus the people and all that stuff. But they recorded the song six months before Gezi Park. And then Gezi Park came along, and it wasn't even them, the band were just kind of like, you know, like, what are we going to do with the song? What are we going to do with the song? And then their producer said, let's, let's make this a tribute, they called it a tribute to Gezi. And so then they made it into an anti, well, uh, uh, whatever, a Gezi Park protest video. So, um, so that's, so yes, if songs can be appropriated into things further down the line. And even the, um, there's a, I've, I've read, um, I think it's by I, Iron Man and somebody, I can't remember now, I'm useless at re remembering things. Um, but there's uh, this whole case study of um, We Shall Overcome how it's, how, you know, how it's, um, how it keeps getting recycled and reused and, and sort of repositioned based on various, you know, throughout history. You know, it started out as a spiritual, um, and then, you know, then the um, sort of the black civil rights in America took it on, and now even anti-abortionists have taken it on, right? So, I mean, so it's an example of what, exactly what you're saying of how, yes, songs can be done and then reappropriated for people's sort of, um, or various movements. Does that answer? Okay. Yeah. I think this is why it's so hard to track down the musical impact because music is, is so contingent and can be associated in so many contexts with so many different meanings. There yeah. was another question in the back first. This thing keeps going by. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I, I want to say, um, like there are many types of this kind of tr uh, songs, tracks produced during protests. They have some temporality, as you mentioned, like in this two weeks, one month period of Gezi protests. Mm -hmm. um, and like um, 
these are produced like mainly uh, to keep people up, like motivate, encourage, and a little bit extrinsic to the protest itself. It was uh, maybe some sort of uh, working for giving some ideas who follow these events on uh, uh, at home on their computers, which they cannot attend to participate to the events, and and then like circulation through social media and somehow and it's. Um, maybe it's, I don't know if it's a good example to demonstrate the politics of protest in itself, um, but maybe a production which also, you know, based on some visual uh, perception and not only auditory uh, sensations, say something about auditory sensations. But uh, I'm, wo I'm more wondering about like this sound and the music and the protests itself, like what kind of politics they can offer uh, or your witnesses about the sound, the soundscape of Gezi protest itself. Um, because, like, yeah, as I said, these are productions at the end. Uh, and I think it's a little bit extrinsic to the politics, uh, to the Gezi protest in itself. Okay. Um, oh, oh, I'm back on. Okay. I'm, I'm a, I think I'm going to answer your question because I'm not sure exactly what you're going. I think this is what you're saying. Um, I thought I was. Hang on, I've got lost again. Um, no, for oh, okay, okay. Yes. Um, okay, you've got a couple of issues going on there. Okay, first of all, um, the idea that these sort of songs were okay, they were produced somewhere outside of the of the park kind of thing, and how political they are. I mean, you're right. There, there's a certain sort of there's lots of debates, isn't there, about the uh, impact the uh, of or the political impact of what we're talking about, the political impact. Of, um, of sort of social media stuff like this, which, you know, and I think you're referring to like slacktivism, aren't you? You know, like people, instead of going out in the streets, you know, they'll, they'll produce one of these things. Um, I mean, I mean the, the answer is I don't have the answer to um, how, you know, the impact. I, I mean, I know, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll go back, um, you know, like I don't, you know, there's a whole huge sort of theoretical debate about how, um, effective is social media things such as this um, in, in, a, in a movement. Um, I guess the only uh, one thing we could do is try to look and think how many views these things get. You know, and um, you know, the Ringo Jets, I, you know, that spring of war, you know, they, they I, th I think, you know, they've got you know, thousands and thousands, and as does this one. Um, and so I would, I would say, well, if they've got thousands of views, you know, people listening and watching these things, um, that's more than, you know, if Erdogan or um, Kılıç Daroğlu, goes, uh, the opposition leader, if he went on YouTube and recorded something, um, this will be w consumed by far more people. Um, but like, again, you know, the, the debate about how political that is, I don't know. Like, you know, there's, there's arguments that say, you know, like, um, you know, that say, the social media had a huge sort of influence on, on the sort of Arab, up, up, you know, Arab Spring protests. Um, and then there's others that say, well, actually, it had no effect. So, I, I, you know, I don't have the answer to that, that part of it. Um, the sounds in the actual park, I mean, like I said, you know, I think this comes back to this idea of context. You know, um, for example, in Gezi Park, I remember like, somebody brought on a grand piano and was playing, you know, like, you know, Mozart or whatever, you know. Um, but that became an act of protest because of the context, you know, of it, you know, them dragging on this grand piano and, you know, with all the police and, you know, all the sort of stuff going on beside them and them playing music, you know, and people sort of singing along to it. A bit like the um, We Shall Overcome, you know, with anti-abortionists singing. Like, bizarre. Um, so I think, so I think I answered, I think you had two questions, I think I answered them. Did I? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Okay. okay, we had one question from Banu over here. I thank you, Lynn, for your presentation. Um, I would, I mean, there are some things that I want to mention, um, but first of all, I would like to ask, do you know if something happened with this group as a political action that they was counter the, the 
AKP or something? I don't think so. No, no? Not, yeah. not that I know of. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to just uh, took attention to, as it's coming, as you said, like from the Black Sea region, and it's a sound like that. I'm, I think that they are still privileged more like more than uh, mi minority groups. I don't know if what would happen if this song include Kurdish words or Armenian words, then um, I think it would be totally changed. And it then actually we couldn't, um, we couldn't take as a Gezi protest sound uh, because I'm also mixed with who's elite there. I mean, what is Gezi Park? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, music was always political in Turkey. I mean, from my parents' time, you know, 1970s, 80s, when the, the, the other coups had affected. Um, and they, 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 there were a lot of bands, music types, and music groups. Um, uh, it's, it's not first time, it just, uh, it's, there's just more um, control, if you want to say, like in, on, on music and all of the art, actually, all the censorship. Um, so what my point was, um, I think this authenticity you were, um, you were um, saying, I see more than authenticity, it's like, as it's happened like in the first three months or first days, it's like being in a protest, having the sensation of uh, solidarity and, and the power of, of uh, occupation, no? And um, I, don't, I don't find it also not so political, not, not more than like being a group, being a, like after years later in Turkey, being a big group and protesting it. But yeah, I mean, I uh, just wanted to comment that. I don't know what you are thinking. I mean, if, when you think about this, Black Sea region sound, hmm. you know? Um, yeah, uh, I'll have to just give you a comment back because there wasn't really a question there. But the comment back was um, when I was writing this book, which you know, I just finished you know, six months ago, um, the last stage, uh, um, I have to bring it back even further. Yes, music has always been political, and that's why we've always had people exiled and people jailed, you know, and especially Kurdish, but not just Kurdish, but um, leftists. Um, and, you know, and, and I go into, I, um, some of the case studies are sort of more historical um, uh, groups, not, not in this, but I refer to lots of sort of historical stuff. So, yes, I agree, yes, it is. It's not a one, this is not a one-off thing, which I think is what you're trying to say. And then... To answer the repercussions, well, in, in, in this book, like I said, Group Yorum, which is very Kurdish sort of uh, rights supporting group, and the group that I just played here, and the Ringo Jet, and you know, all the other groups that I, um, I talk about in this book, um, the, one of the last things I had to do was to get approval for the, me to be able to use their images um, and, and et cetera in, their, um, in my book. And I've known these people, like, you know, I've played with some of these people, um, not all of them, but some of them. Um, but I've known them, I've met them, you know, I, I drink beer with some of them, et cetera, et cetera. And um, everybody's scared now. Everybody, like 2013, as you probably know, because um, I think was a real watershed for Turkey. It's just, you know, I'm gonna now express my biased opinion, it's gone down the toilet um, as far as you know, freedom of speech and the freedom of expression goes. Um, and everybody's scared. And so nobody answered any of my emails. And these are like people I know. Because, you know, and I'd, f and I'd meet them and say, why aren't you answering my email? I said, we c I don't want to write anything. And, you know, and, and basically they said, well, if you use it officially, I didn't give you uh, um, permission, but you know, you can use it. Um, so, so, you know, and even as you know, just this week, just two days ago or three days ago, doctors wrote a letter saying, you know, could you please, can, doctors in Turkey wrote a letter to the government said, could you please not, um, you know, think about war and think about, you know, the fact that it's bad for public health, which is pretty <laughs> mundane stuff, and now they're arrested. You know, everyone's scared. And, and you know, in, in the news every day, like, 
Um, I, I, you know, I, f I follow the news, and uh, just, I think it was two days ago, a woman apparently, I mean, these, these are things that scare tactics they do. A woman apparently was in a bus and was saying things against Erdogan. Somebody in the bus reported her. She got off the bus and she was arrested. You know, and this is all scare tactics, you know, and this is all, um, so bands now, like, are scared, like more scared than before. Um, so I think, anyway, I think that's a comment which I think goes complements what you were talking about. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Since we uh, we are already a little late <laughs> with our day after the first presentation, um, I want to thank you again mm -hmm. at this point. And uh, we have maybe ten minutes break to set up the next presentation, and so stick around and. I hope to see you all again. Thank you, Blender, again.